Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to the NSARS panel discussion. My name is Tara Tucker and it's my pleasure to be your moderator tonight. This event is hosted by Oxford University, Africa Society, and Culture Scoop. This panel discussion focuses on NSARS movement taking place in Nigeria. SARS, which stands for Special Anti-Robbery Squad, is a police unit founded to address violent crimes like an armed robbery, kidnapping in Nigeria. However, this police unit has been plagued with repeated allegations of extrajudicial killings, theft, and abuse. There came a time where enough was enough. Across the world and in major cities of Nigeria, mass demonstrations occurred to end SARS. On Sunday, October 11th, amid continued NSARS protest, the Nigerian police force announced on Twitter that the government has disbanded SARS. SARS may be disbanded, but the struggle is not over, and discussion about the state of Nigeria is necessary. Hence, why we're all gathered here today for this panel discussion, because regardless of your ethnicity, location, and culture, the NSARS movement impacts us all. Today's event will cover three discussion topics. The first, addressing the reason and build up to the NSARS movement. The second, current state of affairs since the NSARS movement. And then the third, discuss realistic and plausible solutions for the NSARS movement. Before we begin, I should probably introduce myself. As I said, my name is Tyra. I study diplomacy at the University of Oxford. I'm also the founder of Culture Scoop, a website that is dedicated to beating ignorance and educating people about world cultures through videos, blogs, and galleries. This event will be published on Culture Scoop, so if you'd like to rewatch it or share it, feel free to go to culturescoop.com and click on NSARS. So, I should probably introduce my panelists. Well, who are the panelists? One of my goals for hosting this event was to bring on people to voice our collective concerns and give us exclusive insight into learning more about the NSARS movement. Our panelists, panelists are quite interesting people. The first panelist I'd like to introduce is Amaka. Recognized by the British Council as one of the top 50 emerging global policy leaders, she's a Nigerian international development professional, writer, and speaker. She's currently doing her PhD candidate at the University of Oxford and served as 2019-2020 president of the Oxford Africa Society. The second panelist that I'd like to introduce is Wale, the founder and editor of The Republic, a journal and platform centering Nigeria and Africa in the world's most critical social, economic, and political issues. He holds a degree from the University of Bath, the London School of Economics, and the University of Oxford, as well as senior researcher at Harvard Business School Africa Research Center. The third panelist that I'd like to introduce is Nelson. Nelson is a Nigerian human rights lawyer, entrepreneur, and founder of Citizens Gavel, a social enterprise that promotes increase in the justice delivery process through access to justice, technology, and citizens' engagement. His goal is to create a better world through tech and innovation and sports. The last panelist that I'd like to introduce is Atkin. He's an entrepreneur and who has relocated back to Nigeria to grow his retail eyewear business. He possesses a degree in industrial engineering from the University of Oregon and a master's degree in engineering management. Now, let's begin the discussion. So, our first discussion topic is addressing the reasons and build up to the NSARS movement. I would like to start with Nelson. Nelson, my question to you is, why did SARS begin? What was the reason that we needed to even create a new police in the state of Nigeria? Hi. Uh, so good evening from Nigeria. <laughs> so um, SARS started some times ago and it was created in response to violent crimes in Nigeria. Um, there was a notorious uh, armed robbery gang that um, was rampaging in Nigeria. And with a view to curb their hesitancies and arrest them and prosecute them, they created SARS. And their modus operandi was to um, wear plain clothes, as opposed to normal police officers who were to be on uniform. And that was to give the officers element of um, surprise when they need to attack uh, the armed robbery guard. And um, there was huge success from that pilot uh, phase uh, because they were able to uh, 
achieve the objective, they were able to cop the SSCs and arrest uh, the um, of armed robots. However, they decided after the success to make it more national. So SARS became something that you find in all the 37 states in Nigeria, technically. So we have the FCT, which is the 37 uh, states, so to say, in Nigeria. So, and um, it started, but the beautiful thing the success they were able to achieve was quickly turned into something else. Because they were able to wear plain coats, they decided to take laws into our hands, become um, not accountable, started violating human rights, extrajudicial killing, extortion, and the likes. So they became even more popular for their human rights violations than the success you know, that they achieved. So that is the brief history of SARS um, in Nigeria. And <clears throat> I wanna propose this question to all of our panelists. When you guys first heard of SARS being established, did you think that it would help Nigeria? Or did you kind of see this coming where it might be, end up being used for corruption or abuse? Um, so, I guess my question to you guys would be, how did SARS go from a police unit to help people to hurt people? Um, if nobody's uh, taking that question, uh, hi everyone. So basically, um, as a young kid growing up in Nigeria in the 80s and uh, 90s, before I relocated to the US, uh, SARS was a dreaded police outfit. Uh, before we even get to the 2000s where they became a nuisance, attacking and harassing young Nigerian males. Let me be very specific. SARS was this group of um, police individuals that basically operated on their own rules and terms. Nigeria is a country that you know has evolved through multiple decades of um, military rule. And with uh, a military junta, the penal codes and the, um, the way they would dish out uh, punishments, you know, even in, in society, you know, it's, uh, say, let's take traffic violation, um, petty theft. They were basically ruthless. I went to a military school growing up. So I can tell you firsthand, um, brutality was basically the order of the day. The police, I would say this, adopted some of those um, tactics in terms of how they would administer justice, so you talk about extrajudicial killing. Uh, it basically started from the mere fact that, you know, if you get stopped by a group of soldiers and they feel like, you know, hey, you just don't pass the, you know, test of being innocent, they could put you on the road, side of the road, pull the trigger, execute you and dump you in the bushes and move on. So the police started adopting some of those behaviors. So with SARS, you now found out that this, special uh, armed robbery squad or response team, whatever you want to call them, felt the need to you know, be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. So with those types of power, with that type of power uh, vested upon them, illegally, not in the constitution, Nigerians basically just adopted the fact that, you know, if you get held by SARS officials, um, they could kill you and call you an armed robber because they could basically just put a pistol or a machete next to your, 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 to your corpse and claim you were a criminal. People then started fearing this outfit and the fear basically just got passed on from generation to generation. So you get to the late 2000s, um, again, 04, 05, with the emergence of cyber crime and they then became the unit on the streets that had interaction with a lot of young Nigerians. So because you now have this concept that a young, 20 year old kid driving a Mercedes to pick a model, CLA, no known source of income, no known employment is possibly the best fit. So you're not going to stereotyping or profiling, it's the best profile for someone that's into cybercrime. So they grab this kid, put him in the back of their car, ask him questions, bully him, scare him, and say, hey, we're going to take you to the ATM, 
you know, pot with 100,000, which is about, uh, let's say, 200 pounds. You know, I don't know what the exchange is, top of my head. And if you don't do that, we're not going to let you know. So it then became a norm. Even a lot of young kids, guilty or not, felt the need to, you know what, make it home alive. Because if this SARS unit takes you and they execute you, nobody can make that argument on your behalf. I'll give you a very firm example. On the 22nd of September, um, and I'll talk about why I became heavily involved in this NSARS protest. 22nd of September at the toll gate where we decided to protest. That's why for me, going up, to, going to the toll gate every day for 12 days became symbolic. It's about 1 a.m. in the morning. I own a pretty uh, reputable business in Nigeria. Uh, so I can call myself a model citizen. I'm leaving the office late, late, late at night. Uh, it's just about the curfew. I go past the toll gate. I pay the toll fee. The gate goes up. I'm driving a nice Mercedes, new model. It's a coupe. And um, I would always hear people tease me that your vehicle is the standard uh, customer or standard type of vehicle they would assume a Yahoo Boy drives. So we'll come back to the Yahoo Boy conversation. And I always laughed it up, like, whatever. I go past a toll. There's two cars in front of me. They jump out with guns drawn, AK-47 rifles. At midnight, and I'm saying to myself, hold up, they're wearing plain clothes. They're wearing bathroom slippers. They're wearing, like, sleeveless jackets, and they're carrying ammunition. At midnight, do I sit back, ask questions, and basically go into the Nigerian conversation of, do you know who I am? Or do I take off trying to evade some type of uh, robbery? So that's what I did. I can tell you um, that was 22nd of September. Protest started on the 10th. That's when I joined the protest. Uh, for nine months leading up to 22nd of September, I can tell you every other week I got harassed by the SARS operative. So again, uh, I just hope I painted a good picture of why SARS, you know, has become so brutal, the history behind people being scared of them, and then how they just became so emboldened, you know, over the past three to four years and continue to operate on chat. Yes. And I want to go to Amaka for this, because I know that you also have your own personal experience with SARS. And there's been a lot of youth that are part of this movement. So it would be interesting if you can tell us about how the youth and the youth's relationship with SARS and why this plays a really pivotal part in this movement. Okay, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, so I think, um, like, other speakers have alluded. Um, part of the way in which SARS officers operate is that they profile a lot of young people. So if you look a certain way, if you drive a certain car, um, if you have dreadlocks, if you have tattoos, if you have iPhones, or if you don't even have any of those things, you become a target. And a lot of um, they justify a lot of their actions um, on the argument that they were fighting cyber crimes or Yahoo Yahoo as other people call it, which is a bit weird because we have an economic and financial crimes commission that has that mandate. And I think that um, part of the reasons why, why to a large extent a certain segment of Nigerian society, why they were able to make those sort of profiling arguments is um, ties into certain generational divides and a lot of, I guess, respectability from the older generation where people expect you to, if you don't dress, your parents expect you to dress a certain way or look a certain way, otherwise you don't look responsible. And then SARS officials leverage on that to say that, oh, because you dress in this way, you carry yourself in this way, therefore you are suspect. And I think, um, so that's when I think another sort of divide is that a lot of young, older people, for instance, you know, they work in, I guess, corporate or government organizations, like former nine to five traditional jobs within the Nigerian society. Um, but for a, lo a lot of young people that are participants in emerging sectors like technology or in the gig economy or in creative sectors that, you know, they don't have to work nine to five. A lot of their jobs are done on the internet, they're largely self-employed and you don't have to dress um, in a formal way. So certain 
strata of Nigerian society are yet to become accustomed to the fact that you know you don't have to wake up and go and sit in an office all day for you to be doing something meaningful. You can actually do that from the comfort of your home. Um, so that's uh, I think one of the other sort of like the broader factors that um, the SARS officials leverage on. And so I think those are like some, I guess, factors. And because of this, almost every young person has had a personal experience with them. I have had like two confrontations with them. I think once I was traveling with a group of people and the car was stopped and we're asked to provide receipts for speakers and like personal equipment and laptops that were in the car, which was weird because you, you don't go around with receipts of your laptop. And and I think it's because of that emotional connection that a lot of young people have. So it's either you have had a SARS experience yourself, or you have, or you know somebody that has had a SARS experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, the movement was able to gather such um, momentum and broadly support across ethnic, gender, class, religions, whatever lines. And I think that's um, to a large extent what gave the movement a very strong sense of legitimacy because historically a lot of this, I guess, mass protests have been mobilized by traditional labor unions or um, civic organizations. And because of that, people are able to, people, I guess, read political interpretations into the motives of these individuals. But because a broad section of young people have had these personal experiences, it was, it, was, it was hard to project political motives, even though it's, I mean, to, to project political motives into the objective. So I think because of that, and I think we were just fed up generally because in the past couple of years, since 2017, which is the first time the hashtag and SARS was used. We've had different um, proclamations from government saying they've dissolved it, they've disbanded it. Different commissions have been um, instituted to look into the, the excesses of SARS, but nothing has been done. And that is why even when the government announced that they had you know, banned SARS and had constituted a new SWAT, people did not believe them because it just felt like typical government rhetoric that wasn't um, focused on addressing the problem, but rather ending the protest, which is a different thing altogether. So I think, um, and then when you situate the behavior of SARS into a broader economy that is um, suffering from record um, rates of inflation, high levels of unemployment, university students have been on strike for about nine months and you have a pandemic, so all of these things came together, I think, to create this moment where people actually came together to say, you know, well, we're tired and we deserve better. Yeah. Thank you. And I want to propose this question to you, Wale. I know that you are the founder of the Republic. Have you been covering this NSARS movement, I guess, before it became a hashtag and a trend, way back then? Or is this just something that's now emerging in journalism and everyone's reading about it? So I think as, as um, I mean, before I start, thank you for, you know, for having this really important event. Um, and I'll just go straight into, into the question. Um, and of course, you know, thank, thank, the, thank everyone in the audience for joining in. Um, like Amaka mentioned, SARS and, you know, and Akin um, also, also provided really helpful context, um, you know, context into. Um, SARS is a very old, um, at least it, it was founded in 1992, the unit itself. Um, and, you know, we've, we've kind of, and I mean, we are about 20, wait, 28 years after that. But NSARS itself, at least in terms of records, like Amaka mentioned, has been mentioned since about 2017. Um, a lot of the police brutality stories and a lot of what's been going on and what people are feeling more com comfortable and confident in sharing you, you do see pockets of that um, happening before the protests started happening. Um, but in terms of coverage, it didn't, of course, receive as much coverage as it does now. What tended to happen were these different elements of police brutality coverage. I think that was the context. There wasn't a, you know, a specific or concerted effort to really highlight this particular unit. 
Mind you, this unit has been covered. It has been covered. It's not the first time, you know, we're hearing about SARS brutality. And of course, you know, like, like Amaka mentioned, it was, you know, we have been seeing NSAS since 2017. And since then, I mean, the government has disbanded or reformed this group at least one, you know, once every year. So you have 2017, it was, I think, disorganized or reorganized or something. They, they've always used a different term, um, you know, to describe it. And a lot of the, that, a lot of those reforms were, you know, influenced by citizen, you know, agitation because people were expressing, you know, the fact that they weren't, they didn't feel safe by, you know, with their own police. But what's happened is, and what makes this, you know, this time very different is that one, the scale of, you know, the pushback is unprecedented, at least when it comes to when it comes to SARS. In the past, what happened was different individuals or different smaller groups coming together to share sto to share stories. I mean, groups like Amnesty International have been covering you know what's been going on for ages, and they had a 2017 report, which I think everyone you know should read. That's been really seminal in influencing a lot of the thinking, at least from our own end, as people covering and really trying to contextualize um, the protests. But what you find that's very different about this time is just the very makeup of how the response has come about is very different. It's a much larger group. It's a much more decentralized group. Um, we, I mean, social movements, protests, they're not new in Nigeria, but we have a very strong habit of, you know, killing the leaders of social movements or co-opting them into um, different political agendas. But this time it's very different because this time it's a group of protesters, individuals, who have refused to come under a single, you know, cohesive unit to avoid, um, you know, trying to kind of operate like a hydra in that sense, you know, being very, um, trying to elude, you know, government co-option. But then you also have a group that's also very deliberate about being a cephalus. There's no leader. There's pretty much no one person that you can identify or no one group that you can identify as a particular leader of, you know, of these protests. Whereas in the past, what you'd had was we did have, you know, NSARS um, or, or movements that had or protests that had similar objectives, but had groups that many would argue today have been co-opted or many would argue today are, you know, have become complicit in some of the police brutality um, that we've been seeing continue over the years. And so it's kind of like frustration with the fact that, you know, you've had this group that has been reformed, that has been pushed against for at least for years, but nothing has been done. And so the motivation that a lot of the protesters had this time is we need to do something different. We need to do it in a way that guarantees our own safety, but also guarantees the longevity of whatever reform we're trying to push for. And one of those ways is by avoiding, um, you know, co-option from the government. Thank you so much. My, I think now we should move on to the second discussion topic, which is the current state of affairs and talking about the protests. I want to start with you, Adkin, because I know that you've, as you said, been on the front lines. What is happening in Nigeria? How were the protests like? What were people chanting? What was it like? What was the energy? So, um, uh, it's, uh, I just got a bit nostalgic there. So, um, I joined the protest about uh, the 11th of October. I got off a flight from Abuja, I got to Lagos, and I live about five minutes from the toll plaza. And I get a text message saying, hey, toll gate has been taken over. I said, wow, that's incredible. I changed my outfits, put on a t-shirt. Somebody made me an NSARS t-shirt from Abuja. And I head up to the protest grounds about two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I'm there and I'm like, wow, this is incredible. There's a van, there's a DJ booth, speakers, probably about a thousand people. I said, all right, you know, we'll probably be here till nightfall and the government will come chase everybody away. Um, social media, hashtag, I'm texting a couple of buddies. And um, behind one of the toll booths where you pay money, it said toll booth 15. I said, hey, anybody coming here? Look for me, toll booth 15. So it became a popular um, hangout spot. I'll talk about that later. And um, I spent the first night there. Energy was very um, positive. And people were just, you know, again, talking about stories, those small pockets of conversations. Uh, DJ OB and a couple others had volunteered their, their time, you know, with music, microphone. There was AY, Ayodeji. Uh, there was Bishop, who's equally an entertainer. And it's just, it was so disorganized, but extremely organized. 
And then I saw a tent go up. I saw water coming in. There was food in the corner. I'm walking around. Mobile toilet uh, was not available the first day. So I'm asking questions. Who's bringing what? Who's being what? And then I realized there was a lot of uh, leadership taking place. People started organizing without even conversating. Uh, hey, I'm going to go home. I get hand sanitizers. I'm going to get, you know, toilet rolls. Um, we need, uh, what do you call it, coolers for cold drinks. We need this and we need that. And people just started showing up. From the protest ground in Ikeja, a couple of people would, you know, again, bounce between locations. And social media basically became that um, network that kept everyone in sync. Um, by the next day, uh, Monday, I came back to the Toho Plaza at two o'clock, same energy, same crowd, more tents, people lining up, getting lunch. The place was clean. That's the first thing I noticed because the night before I left, there was so much trash everywhere. 7 a.m. in the morning, I had a cleanup crew. Cleanup crew didn't have a list of people. There was no leader. It was just leadership by, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know how to explain it. And a lot of that happened. And um, day after day, I, I started staying till about eight, nine o'clock at night. People started making t-shirts. There were people that would bring their equipment on site. They were making headbands, set ensigns. People were coming with flags. Uh, lots of people just showing up. Um, at about uh, the fourth day into the protest, I realized, okay, I've been there one night. Some hoodlums started showing up, uh, miscreants, you know, from the area. I decided, hey, let's get uh, private security. I did some crowdfunding. I paid for about 45 security staff to work uh, internal security for the event. Now, Feminist Go, some others had done perimeter security, but then inside of the crowd, where there's 2,000 people, 3,000 people, it started getting somewhat unsafe. So we introduced that, we put security around the stage, and then before we knew it, it was a little, it was a small family. No WhatsApp group chats, no emails, no attendee sheets, no leadership structure, but everything was just so organic. People come to me, hey, do you need water? Do you need, do you need a drink? Do the security guys need help? A lot of my friends started showing up, people that you would naturally not even find at protest. So I can say that the demographics were so diverse, people were closing from work you know, I'm from work, living hospitals. I saw medical doctors that are my friends. And by the eighth day, which was um, the Friday before the massacre, no, the seventh day, um, the crowd got so big. I remember getting up on stage and I looked and I could see a sea of people. I, I'm not exaggerating. There must have been an excess, probably excess of 10,000 people at the toll grounds. And I said, my goodness, this is incredible. I mean, nobody is running ads. You didn't do any, any kind of promo. There's no gifts or, you know, lottery. People are just showing up and saying one thing, answers. So some nights, uh, Obi and some of the other uh, volunteers would leave to go home. I got on stage one day and, you know, some guy was like, hey, take the mic. I've got to go home. I'm tired. I'll be here eight hours. And then I'll take the mic. I'll be there from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. working with the sound crew. It's just answers. People getting up on stage, talking about their ordeals, recounting experiences, and the message got very, very patriotic to the point I said to myself, this cannot be real. Um, push it forward a bit uh, to the Monday before the massacre, the energy was the same. Same crowd was turning out. People were not even going home to take showers. They probably would go home 30 minutes, come back. It was the place you wanted to be. Uh, even I myself, um, I even told my staff, I said, hey, if you need to take the day off to go protest, go ahead. And I think there was a lot of understanding amongst people in the community saying, you know what, for once, if people are choosing to protest peacefully, we would do everything to support them. I had my neighbors, elderly Nigerians, showing up with SUVs, opening the trunks of their cars and say, hey, I made food for 500 people. So you had a very peaceful atmosphere, a lot of self-organizing, self-coordinating, and um, amazing leadership, talking about Feminist Co., what they did with fundraising, accountability. My goodness, it was just incredible. So anyways, uh, I'll stop there and not say too much. Yeah, and Amaka, I know that you um, brought an NSARS protest to Oxford. Is that right? How was that like, being... Obviously, you're not in Nigeria right now, but still wanting to take part of it, still wanting to be part of that movement. Uh, we've seen protests all over the world for NSARS. Can you tell us about your experience doing it from abroad? 
Well, um, so I think that, um, like I had said before, even if you don't have a personal experience with SARS, you have friends or family that has um, been treated badly by the SARS or the broader Nigerian police. So regardless of wherever in the world um, you reside, um, you know, you, it, it wasn't alien. You, you were very familiar with this unit. So everyone felt that, you know, we had to do something. And I think um, the, because of how the movement was structured and the, the lack of, will I say, I'm hesitant to use the word, I'm hesitant to say there wasn't leadership. Maybe there weren't appointed spokespersons, but then if you define leadership in terms of delivering certain structures, I would argue that there was leadership because you had legal service, you had healthcare and all of that, but that's by the way. But the, the nature of the fact that there weren't like appointed in, institutions or individuals that claimed leadership, I think that created a sense of ownership amongst people both locally and in the diaspora. And oftentimes you'd ask yourself, what can you do in your own personal sphere of influence to support the movement back at home. So if you aren't on the streets protesting, what can you do? You can, you know, organize protests in your own local environment and you can amplify the message online. And I think it was, you know, the, the diaspora played a very important role um, in terms of the mobilization of funds, um, you know, sending money and supporting and helping to trend the hashtag on Twitter because oftentimes when people in Nigeria go to sleep, people in Canada or in the US will still be up and they kept them just find the message. And I feel it was very personal to a lot of people. A lot of people that migrate out of Nigeria do so out of reluctance. Under normal circumstances, if um, if they felt the society was delivering for them or you know they were they, if, if they were assured, if they had confidence, they would be there. So many of their support was, I guess, a form of protest because they, for a lot of people, I think that are spoken to under other circumstances, they'll, they'll be home. So it was, so they were, they were motivated to support. And I think um, personally, it's, it makes you kind of reflect on the role the diaspora can play in democracy and I guess, um, sort of social mobilization, because oftentimes when you, a lot of the talk on democracy in, I guess, in academic literature in certain policy circles always focuses on remittances and how much, um, you know, a popular statistic, you know, you hear often banning about is the fact that a lot of African countries, including Nigeria, receive more in remittances than in foreign aid. But I think this, um, this movement has illuminated much more significant and potentially more substantive ways that the um, diaspora can help engage and support movements back at home. Not only were they important sources of funding and I guess social media activity, but a lot of them, you know, matched to diplomatic capitals in different parts of the world. A lot of people within the UK wrote to their local MPs um, asking for the matter to be raised um, in parliament. Some people in the US, you know, got in touch with the different, I guess, relevant caucuses within Congress to, you know, bring the issue to the forefront. I, I think recently we signed a, there was a change.org thing that um, was arguing for uh, travel restrictions to be placed on, on individuals or leaders that were, um, have been promoting brutality against the protesters. So I think, um, now, there's been, I guess, a lot of reflection within different groups, both locally and internationally, um, within diaspora to see what they can do, how they can support the work at home. And I think that it's, I, I, for me, I find it really hopeful and I hope we build on some of the successes because oftentimes, or sometimes, um, people in diaspora don't know how to effectively help, or some people assume that they can help and you know go on to do things that might not really be necessary but now we see that one way which is clear that we can help is to support the efforts that are back at home and you know amplify and 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 strengthen and support organizations that are actually working on the ground um yeah Great, thank you. And I'm really curious to know for your audience member, Wally, what was their reactions been like um, from reading all of your articles? I want to know, do you think that this movement transcends Nigeria and affects Africa and, you know, potentially even the whole world? 
Yes, I think that's a, you know, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, we're obviously in a very interesting time. I think this year has been, you know, I mean, the big elephant in the room being the pandemic and things like that. But at the same time as the protests were happening, you know, you also had protests happening across, you know, different states, um, or rather different, um, by states, I mean different, you know, different countries, different regions in, in, in Africa as well. You had, for, you know, the women-led protests in Namibia, for example. And I think that with our audience, what's been very interesting and what's, you know, where we've been seeing a lot of interest is in how to kind of connect all these protests or all these movements together. It's kind of how to think about these movements as not things that are happening in vacuums. Um, you know, other African countries are, have also, at whatever different points, um, had protests against police brutality as well. So it's also inviting discussions around the broader, um, you know, around police brutality as a regional issue. One of the very interesting things that came out during the process was, you know, what would be the AU's position and the African Union's position on, on what's happening in Nigeria. And I think when you do start to think about it in a regional perspective, you then, of course, start to invite those types of discussions as well. Because one of the things that we'd seen with a lot of official institutional response to, you know, to the protest was that they were very slow. But then when you do have the conversation that this is not just something that's happening in Nigeria, but it's something that needs to be treated as a regional issue. And of course, when you then consider what's happened, what's, you know, the different protests that have happened in, you know, in the UK and also in the US, should we also then start to think about this as an international issue? What is the actual problem or what is the actual root cause of police brutality? And why is it that in certain countries, like for example, in Nigeria, why is it that the go-to response with policing is not necessarily to de-escalate, but to actually, you know, meet out violence? And so it's having, you know, people are beginning to have discussions. Our audience, you know, is beginning to have discussions and beginning to kind of want to see more discussions around things like police reform, around even issues like prison abolition, around, you know, issues like even police abolition in general. And really those discussions, we all know, you know, these are discussions that have been led you know, typically by black female scholars. And so it's really inviting a lot of discussion, particularly within the African diaspora. So there's a lot of interesting discussions happening, you know, in that sense. And I think it's a very interesting time to be having those discussions because on the one hand, you do have coronavirus that, you know, that is showing us a kind of international dimension to, you know, to, to the pandemic and to global health. And it's also revealing actual, you know, inequalities in global health. I mean, we all saw, for example, the French um, interview where they talked about testing um, on, on African subjects. And so you're seeing that kind of racial underlining of global health that's been exposed through the pandemic. And so we're now beginning to ask ourselves, what are the racial dynamics that we're going to learn and that we're going to actually reveal and uncover when we begin to treat police brutality as not only a Nigerian issue, but also a regional issue and also an international issue. So this, you know, starts inviting conversations from colonization to even, I mean, there was a, um, a, a recent news report about how Britain had trained um, the, ENSA, um, the SARS police unit itself. And so you're having all these conversations around, you know, global south and global north relations when it comes to policing and also looking at policing as a wider international issue in which, as you can expect, you know, the less developed or poorer countries are actually suffering um, more. Thank you. And Nelson, I'm curious to know, are these SARS officers being held accountable? What is being done to really make sure that this NSARS movement, the issues that have been proposed, have plausible solutions, that the youth are being addressed and that people are being held accountable? Well, that's not happening. I think at the moment it's not happening. And if it is happening, it's not happening fast enough. I think a lot of the conversations that we're seeing are, well, you know, things, you know, things with the government take time and there's a lot going on in the background, ETC. But in terms of what we're seeing on the surface level, um, the most concrete response beyond, you know, obviating and circumventing the actual issue and beyond actually meeting out more violence, which the government has actually done to, you know, to protesters through bank freezes, arrests, um, we're seeing, I think, the most concrete um, the most concrete response we've seen from the government are these 28 judicial panels that have been set up across Nigeria, including um, in Lagos. And these panels have three functions, which are, you know, to, um, to 
uh, figure out compensation for people who have been uh, brutalized by the police, to start to think about how they can get justice, and to also investigate into you know, um, um, uh, cases of police brutality. But for anyone who's been monitoring these panels, they are a perfect example of what it means to really delay an issue and what it means to kind of just wear people down. The panels are you know, ridiculously disorganized. They are very much inconclusive. And at the same time as these panels are happening, protesters are still being kind of harassed by the government and by government forces as well. And so there's a kind of inconsistency that's going on here. And I think even at the last um, panel, which happened last week, um, the youth representatives, I think the panels have about eight people. Um, and then there's an additional two um, youth representatives as well. And so those two representatives had to boycott the panel because one of them um, had had her bank account frozen by the central bank. And so it's also inviting all these conversations around just how, you know, how independent is the central bank? Is the central bank, is this within, you know, the central bank's purview and remit to actually freeze um, people's bank accounts on the grounds that they were peacefully protesting? And so we're not seeing the kind of responses that we had hoped, um, that, that I think the protesters and, and, and every young person had hoped to see. Um, and anyone can speak to, you know, the five demands that um, young people have expressed, even though we may have, for example, I have my own personal views on those five demands, but I think these are five demands that reach consensus, which include you know, the fact that um, there should be immediate release of all arrested protesters. If anything, more protesters have been arrested. We've asked, well, young people have asked for justice for all deceased victims of police brutality and appropriate compensation for their families. But all we've seen is adjournments of all these judicial panels whose responsibilities are actually to deliver both justice and compensation. Um, we've asked for setting up an independent body to oversee the investigation and prosecution of police um, misconduct. We've seen that with the judicial panels, but like I mentioned, these are very ineffective and very inefficient um, judicial panels. We've also asked for psychological evaluation and retraining of all disbanded SARS officers before they can be redeployed. If anything, the officers have already been redeployed and there are multiple reports of the SARS officers still being um, present in streets. So they haven't necessarily been disbanded. If anything, there's just kind of a delay on that. Um, and we haven't necessarily seen this psychological evaluation happen. And then, you know, this is where things get contentious. They, you know, young people have also asked for an increase in police salary. Um, to ensure that they are adequately compensated for, and, you know, to protect the lives and property of citizens. And I think the argument here is, you know, police themselves are also victims of a, of, of a very exploitative system. And so if you can increase their salaries, it reduces the chances that they will accept bribes. But we know from reports um, and from similar, um, and from similar um, regions where this has happened, I think, for example, um, a platform in Nigeria, um, Stairs Business, had covered um, similar reforms happened in Ghana, they were not successful. If anything, you know, compensating people more doesn't necessarily reduce corruption. And what, what had happened in Ghana was that it actually increased um, the level of corruption. And so despite the fact that these, you know, demands have been made, nothing has really happened. If anything, things are very inconclusive and the government just seems bent on actually punishing visible members of, of the protests. Thank you. And that gets us to our third discussion topic, which is an action plan and finding solutions. This is a question for all of our panelists. How should we go forth from here? What does the Nigerian government need to do to make sure that SARS comes to an end? And as well, I would love to know all of your opinions on SARS itself. Um, and if you think that, I guess I should say, if you feel that maybe still is not enough, still, still hasn't been enough done. Um, so please do let me know your opinions and it's a question open to all of our panelists. Sure, so I'll um, right. jump in. All right, so. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I'm gonna start with Nelson. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so basically I need to make some ground rules. The NSAS was not actually about SARS alone, the Special anti robbery Squad. It was about the Nigerian police force as a whole because, um, even where SARS were notoriously violating human rights, the Nigerian police force as an entity was also an accomplice in that fact. Many of the incidents of violation that happened were not from SARS personnel alone. Many were also from regular police officers who were notorious for extortion and 
violation. You can hardly go to a police station without paying a bribe money. Even as a lawyer, it's very difficult. You have to argue your way out of that police station. I have to make so many calls to ensure those officers are accountable. Now, 70% of our prison population are awaiting trial. Where, where does that come from? It comes from a rogue and a very unaccountable system of policing that has led into the huge congestion in a prison and you have a 70% awaiting trial. What awaiting trial means is 70% are held in prison which are deep innocent under the law, but they are still being held in prison without um, pros um, adequate prosecution. And what, what, what causes that is because they were probably ar arrested without sufficient evidence, they were thrown into jail without sufficient inv investigation. So you see how that trickles down. And if you see uh, um, policing as, as the bigger um, side of, of a funnel, the bigger side of the further is where you ingest um, um, people into the criminal justice system. The outer part of that funnel is the prison and the correctional facility. Once the, the bigger part of the funnel is not re re regulated, then you have a huge problem within the criminal justice uh, pipeline. Now, another major issue that we've not talked about is the fact that even when you institute a case in the court of law, and the court decides that the case is in your favor, you cannot, it's very difficult, near impossible for you to enforce the judgment against police officer. For example, if pol uh, the court decides that, oh, you've been violated and you have 10 million naira in damages, you cannot enforce that decision because number one, it's either you go through a garnishing proceedings. If you go through a garnishing proceedings, which means you have to enforce it against the uh, police bank account to force them to pay you that damages. It's very difficult because police will not obey. Because there is a provision, Section 84 of the Sheriff's Civil Process Act, provides that the Attorney General of the Federation must sign off on that garnishing procedure. And the Attorney General of the, <laughs> of the Federation is a government officer. He would not sign off. Even if you are able to scale up to that, you have to go through the CBN. The CBN also is a regulatory body for banks. They are under the government. They will not sell. So you see where the frustration is coming from and where people have to go into the street to take, uh, the, uh, make sure that this um, police um, institution is um, accountable. So uh, it's, it's a very multifaceted problem. It's not just uh, a problem that comes from maybe the police act. I, I was involved in, in, in the pushing for the police act. I remember speaking in the, in the Senate uh, uh, and, and I told them that the urban rights must be mainstreamed into the police act. But it was passed sometimes in September this year. The act that we were using prior to then was the 1943 Act that was signed into law during the Corona era. But September, we got the Act. September, August, I, I forgot the exact month. We got the Act, it was signed by the president. But since then, nothing has been done on that Act. No implementation plan, nothing, anything. Section one and section two of that Act provide specifically for human rights uh, provisions and that it should be mainstreamed into the police system. No retraining was done. Um, no um, official accountable system was put in place for, for all this. All this other. So it's, it's a uh, multifaceted problem that is not, you, it's not just uh, uh, a problem that um, an art or, or paying and increasing uh, police wages can face. I think what we need to do from, 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 from get-go is have the political will without to ensure that the whole police institution is reformed. Now, we have a, a law that is uh, a little bit better than what we had. How can we hold the police in compliance to that law? How can the president ensure that the whole police system is overhauled in such a way that is structured as in, um, in form of a police service, not police force that is 
presently? How can all the officers be retrained in such a way that they respect human rights? An average officer sees it like I can shoot you and nothing will happen. And in the true sense, nothing will happen. We have cases in court. Colladi Johnson's case is still in court. We are involved in that case and so many other cases. While the NSAS process were going on, I was busy running from one police station to another to ensure that uh, uh, people are left off the hook in police detention. All these things speaks to the fact that an average uh, police officer does not recognize or respect human rights uh, uh, in, in Nigeria. There are so many laws, anti-torture heart is there. However, you see one of my clients recently was tortured with a machete in a police station. And, and he was flogged with the machete to the extent that he, he lost part of his, uh, one of his hair, you know? So he, 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 the, the system is a, 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 a system of, from top to bottom, everything is rotten, is, is, is bad. And it takes a, a president and a government that is really serious with restructuring the police to make it happen. It takes more than a pronouncement. It takes dedication and diligence and putting foot boots on, on ground. So many people are calling for, um, fine, the judicial panel is at least, even though it does not meet the old demand, it's better than not having nothing. But however, the National Human Rights Commission is there and is saddled with the responsibility to uphold human rights across the federation. However, the actual human rights commission has not even been given a governing council. So it's very difficult for them to function properly. The national human rights commission, the executive director cannot call the police chief on phone and say, I'm coming to police station to check your detention facility that uh, people are not held in perpetuity in, in, uh, um, against the law. You will have to call the police uh, IG and tell them, I'm coming and I need to take permission from you. That are scenarios that we've seen. So we need that political will. -will. And I think what, one of the things that the, 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 the foreign Indians can do here is to ensure that uh, they can support the local demands that we have um, in Nigeria to drive uh, uh, a structure of accountability. People are calling for visa vans. Yes, let's get visa, visa vans because Nigeria, an average Nigerian politician can easily com compromise the judiciary. We've seen that happen in several instances. But they fear issues like visa vans, bans. They fear issues. Yeah. And we're going to wrap okay. it up quickly because I need to be mindful of time. I'm going to give one more panelist if you guys would like to propose any action plans or any solutions to help with this NSARS movement. And just to be mindful of time to maybe make it a minute or two. Yeah, um, can I just say, I think that most of um, what Nelson discussed were like really long term solutions to some of these problems. But I just like to emphasize some more sh short term measures that I think will go a long way. Um, part of the reasons why while the protests la lasted for as long as they did was lack of trust um, between the protesters and the government. And I think um, that is why after they announced so many things they claimed they were going to do, people still remained on the streets. And what we really want now is a measure of good faith from the government to show that they are serious. The government cannot claim to be serious about ending SARS if they keep on freezing accounts of protesters, um, arresting people indiscriminately, preventing people from traveling, and doing all of those things. Um, that doesn't, that, that isn't a signal of a government that is actually serious. And then, you know, the incidents in Lagos State, for instance, you have the government of Lagos State still denying the facts of the um, killings at Lekki. Initially, it was claimed that nobody died. Initially, it was claimed that the army wasn't there. Then the army admitted they were there. And then the government said, oh, um, you know, and the army said it was the government that um, invited them. So if you have a, gov a, a, a governor of a state that has you know, carried around several versions of the event, that doesn't inspire confidence. And that personally undermines the legitimacy of the judicial panel in Lagos because 
the government isn't behaving as though, you know, it, it, it seems as though the priority is just to get people off the street, but not actually address the problem. So I think that's on the part of the government. And from the part of the protesters, I think that going forward, we've seen a lot of the structures built during the um, protests that appear to be continuing. So the people that started the legal aid um, mechanisms have continued their work post the protest, which is good. Um, people that, that had the food bank, many people have, um, they've proposed to continue it in addition to civic education. You have groups um, outside of the diaspora, within diaspora that are building coalitions on how to like support future movements. So I think these are welcoming signs in terms of civic organization. Um, and I think this, this is one of the, I guess, um, long-term impacts, this building of the civic culture that I hope we can continue post, um, post SARS. Would you like to go? I was um, just going to add to that. If I jump in uh, just quickly. Uh, so uh, I think there's something. One or two minutes more and then we'll go to Wale. Sure. We're missing something here. There are lots of people that were killed. I sat there at the protest ground. I saw people take bullets to the head. People take bullets to the stomach. People take bullets to the limbs. I have somewhere in a safe house in Lagos, seven survivors with bullet wounds that are being treated every day. Um, for fear of coercion, harassment, and even possibly being killed. They've not been able to go home to their normal lives. Um, you had a state government that said only two people died from the massacre, but they've not told us their names. The cause of death from the state government was stampede. We have troves of evidence, pictures, videos that, were, that are yet to hit the internet were simply saving to take it into court, into the panel. So uh, I'm only highlighting this bit on the fact that there's a judicial process that has to take its um, turn. And while we can talk about policy all day, there are people that are walking around. Uh, we had a guy just lose his mental capacity. He's basically run mad from a bullet to the head. So for some of those victims, uh, they need closure. Uh, Nigeria is a country where we just gloss over, turn the page, move on to the next event, and we're into Christmas, life goes on. So I'm only saying this because for the international community, again, full disclosure to everyone on the group, I had to flee Nigeria. I left Nigeria last weekend. So you're talking about passport seizures, you're talking about bank accounts being frozen. I've suffered all of that. I was in hiding for 12 days. I had to leave the country. Save for myself and maybe one other person, you've probably not seen any other NSARS volunteers or major organizers on TV circuits talking to the media because they're all in hiding. They are all in hiding, capital H. So let's not gloss over that. Some of us may have the luxury of sitting on panels, disclosing our locations, going out to eat breakfast in the morning. Many of these people cannot move. I can tell you this, we had to exile two other people to neighboring countries just to give them that air to be safe. So I'm only saying this because part of what we want to do is, again, make sure that there's international focus on this case. As we're going to the panels, the two youth reps need a lot of support. Uh, for the victims, many of them will start coming out uh, as part of the hearings. Uh, again, I heard good news that DJ Switch is out the country, which is good because she cannot be out the country and not have the voice to speak. Uh, part of the plans we're hoping for is the case with the International Criminal Court the UN tribunal, uh, you know, to make sure that we can hold the government accountable. And equally, people are talking about visa bans. That's not where it hurts. When we decided to stay back on Tuesday, October 20th and protest, we made a decision among ourselves. We said, hey, we might not leave this place alive. Some of us actually had the DSS coming after us while at the protest ground, but were able to evade arrest. And I say this because Nigeria is a country where you have to hit them where it hurts. Depriving the state government of 234 million in revenue collection at the toll to making sure they met the five for five demands, again, was something beyond their comprehension. The Nigerian government needs to get hit in the pocketbooks. Sale of arms from foreign countries does not need to happen. We're talking about UN aid, all kinds of support they get. You have to hit them in the pocketbooks. So for us going to court, following the legal process, making sure that we can get due diligence out of, again, quote unquote, laws we claim to abide by, we need the international community to come in, support, and hopefully we're, we're, we're seeing that we can be on our pathway to justice. I just had to throw that in there, sorry. Wally, would you like to go? Uh, thanks, Aki. I think those are very, very, you know, those are very important um, comments for us to, you know, to consider, especially coming from, you know, someone who was at the front line of these protests and who definitely does understand the reality and the gravity of what's going on. But I just have a couple of, you know, next steps that I think are very, you know, are very important that we pay attention to. These are just split across short term, medium term, long term. So in the short term, Amnesty International has a petition that's ongoing 
Um, and I think this is something that every single one of us can do from wherever you are. I'm just going to try and pop it into, I'm trying to pop it into the chat. When I figure out how to, when I figure out, when I figure out how to do that, I will put it in. But if you can, you know, if you can sign that, it's going, you know, this is of course an organization. It's nice that we're all coming together and agitating, but as much, you know, and, and pushing for this change, but as much as possible, we need to support the organizations that have the infrastructure. And of course, Amnesty International is one of, um, okay, yes, I found, I found the chat, so I'll put it, um, I'll put it in there um, now. Um, the second thing is paying attention, paying really close attention to the justice panel. Um, one of the things about justice panels and one of the things about the way that justice panels work in Nigeria is that they can be protracted. But, you know, a very good co um, corollary to think about is how like voter suppression works in which, you know, you, you make it take so long that people just give up and they pay no attention. So justice panels, they will take long, they will be boring, but we need to give them as much attention. They will not be as exciting as watching people demonstrate on the streets, but we need to give them as much attention. We need to talk as much about them and we need to follow what is going on. A couple of media, you know, local media houses are following, um, are following what's going on. You can also follow what's going on by looking at um, the Lagos SARS panel. That's their Twitter handle. They usually have a live feed that goes on. Once again, it's called the Lagos SARS panel. Um, and you can just follow what's going on, put pressure on them. If they're, you know, if they're late, comment on them being late. If there's something that's not clear, demand an explanation. Because, like I said, the government is trying to push us or trying to push young people to follow due process. But due process takes a very long time. And a lot of people do get frustrated. And that's where we lose. And so you have to put as much effort into that as well. Then the final thing that I will say is as we puts more pressure on people as we amplify, which is very, very useful and which the diaspora has been you know, very great at doing. We need to continue to emphasize that this was a peaceful protest. Official communication has, you know, has taken a different approach to this in trying to stress that they were disruptors, they had their own political motivations. But, you've see, but from what we've discussed, you understand that these are just individuals who have a shared common experience of police brutality and these were peaceful protests. And so as we think about how to move or how to you know, um, shift energies from what we've done, um, from the protests that we've done recently and how to kind of leverage infrastructure for more civic education and things like that, remember that these were peaceful protests and remember the strengths of these protests, the fact that it relied a lot on exchanges. There's been a lot of discussions on grassroots education, which is often top down, but we also know that for countries like Nigeria, there's a lot of value that comes in engaging the grassroots from an equal platform. So instead of thinking about grassroots or civic education as a top-down effort, think about it as an exchange, you know, as something where we, you know, we give as much as we learn from the people who have to live the majority of, of, of these, you know, of these realities. Police brutality affects all of us, but also just remember that across income levels, across class levels, it's very different. People at the grassroots really suffer and really know Nigeria or really know African countries in ways that, you know, more elite and more middle class groups do not. So when we think about civil, you know, civic education, let's think about it as an exchange as opposed to a top down effort. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. We are now going to go into a Q&A, so I'm going to switch it over to Elisha. Um, it's been a great discussion. I have learned so much. I want to thank everyone as well that is tuned in. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new, and I'm definitely going to check out the Amni Interna International and sign it. It's so, so important. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Tyra. Um, so we have a few questions that have been posted on the chat uh, chat box. And if, if you guys, if there's anyone who'd like to ask a question themselves, that would also be fine. Just raise your hand and I'll see that. Um, so I think first of all, to just thank our panelists and you, Tyra, for this wonderful discussion. Um, I think as a Kenyan myself, uh, some of the things that we, we've talked about and mostly about police brutality, is something that is common and cuts across most of the African countries, including Kenya itself. And I remember this was one of the big things that we also had to go through, maybe not to the scale that Nigeria went through, but during the uh, 
um, COVID-19 uh, period and the when the government was imposing um, rules on how to, we had a curfew and you, you'd see that there was a lot of police brutality just based on how people are being treated during those curfew periods. So this is something that is common and I think um, like uh, the, the panelists have talked about, it cuts across most of the African countries and it's important that we have this discussion. Thank you. So I'll start with the first question that has been asked by, um, I'm not sure I'll pronounce this name well, but Boyega, and it's a question to the panelists. So do the panelists believe that the deaths could have been avoided if the movement was structured and had leadership? Um, I'm going to ask Akin to respond to this. So um, the NSARS movement, uh, basically was a headless snake, okay? And I say that with a lot of um, seriousness because had it been, there was, a name, there was a known leader, there was a name, there was a corporate address, a logo, a phone number. Nigeria, African countries in general have this concept of cutting the head of the snake and then, you know, everything kind of falls apart. Uh, and I do believe that, you know, it holds true because we have a society where somebody's either funding it from their pockets or there's probably energy from a certain source. The minute you get rid of that source, the entire movement dies. That's why the NSARS movement, as organic as it was, led to it being extremely successful. I can tell you there were days I would show up at five o'clock and somebody would ask me, hey, I didn't think you were coming. I brought hand sanitizers. I already bought some three hours earlier. No communication, no conversations, no group syncing of task or deliverables management. People just stood up and got it done. So, Back to your question, uh, the Tuesday, October 20th, we stood there at 1.30 p.m. and said, hey, are we gonna stay back or are we gonna dissipate? Um, if we're staying back, what do we need? We need supplies, water, food, keep people here 24 hours. And we, get, we wanted to procurement mode. A quick two hour task to crowdfund. We got everything we needed as of 4.15 p.m. Coffee was supposed to start four o'clock, so we're ready, set to go. Now, thinking about casualties, we said, hey, there's no way the military, the police will come in here and see us sitting down, we bought flags, with the anthems going, no missiles, no kind of weapons, no agitation. The last thing that happened in Lekki phase one Nigeria in 2020 is to have them fire upon peaceful protesters. We were wrong. So the, mean, the reason why we even continue protesting was knowing that we had a government we cannot trust. So whether you had an organization, you had structure, could, it, could the deaths have been avoided? Again, Nigeria is a country where sometimes you have to force progress. I, it, it may sound very crass and uh, extremist, but it's just what we understand. And I think the people have to give it back to the government, the only way the government understands it. Now, the destruction of property and all the looting that happened was because the government was derelict in their duties. The police did not come out to work for weeks. They just basically said, hey, they are protesting, we'll stay home. But guess what? They're going to get paid. It's, just, it's their duty to provide security, not for the protesters to protest, and the streets are available for hoodlums to take over. So I don't know if I answered your question. It's a complex question, but I try to put some context to it. It is Can a I? Thank you. Can I? Yes. Thank you yes. Very much. yes. Yeah. 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 And I think that um, the question is premised on the assumption that if there was the leaders, some of the killings of innocent protesters would have been avoided. But um, I think we can easily look to Nigeria's history to um, there are a lot of examples. You have the case of Ken Sarua that stood up and was ex executed. And the, I think the truth is that violence is in the character of the Nigerian state over time. That is, um, that has evolved as a mechanism through which they have chosen more often than not to engage with citizens as opposed to actual discussions. So it, it might have been weird ha ha happening in a cosmopolitan city like Lagos, but these are regular occurrences in the southeast, in the south, south, in the northeast. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, I, I think whether there were, there were leaders or there weren't any leaders, this is a consistent uh, manner of response from the Nigerian state and its security apparatuses. Thank you, Amaka. Um, the next question is, do the panelists, uh, sorry, so that has, I think I've already asked that one. Um, the next one is, Will this end SARS movement boomerang into a political movement to promote youth inclusion in politics? This is a question that's been asked by Idosa Idada. Um, and I think I'm gonna ask Nelson to respond to this. 
Hi. So uh, part of the conversation we've been having is how can this evolve into a political movement? Because NSAS is not just about police brutality. When NSAS started, we've seen um, end bad governance. And the old things uh, spells bad governance. Uh, so if we've had a good governance, there wouldn't be, have been issues of police brutality and the need for us to pro protest. So we've come to that realization and, and there are underlining conversations around uh, some of the vocal persons on the need to um, get involved in politics. But as you may be aware, Nigeria has two major political systems, uh, two major political parties, pardon me. And those two parties are more or less like two sides of the same coin. They, they have, technically for me, they have no value system, they have no foundational manifesto or alignment to a particular industry crisis. So based on that, if young people need to evolve, they need to kind of um, join other polit um, parties that are not within the two major, uh, major political parties or form a new party, you know, to, to push for the agenda of, of good governance. But one thing I've seen is that NSAS has awakened a sense of activism and a sense of we can do better and a sense of we need good governance. And people are willing to, to ensure that that is done by joining politics. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, th there's a very important point that has been raised by Michael Henshaw, and he says that I think trust is still a critical issue post NSAS. Government's actions to address issues post NSAS haven't been encouraging. We've seen a uh, blame game on the Lekki incident, wider issues with COVID relief, um, holding for, uh, COVID relief holding following the protest, ETC. Trust and transparency are needed between the government, panelists, and the general populace. So I think that's that's a very important um, thing. And I wonder whether any anyone in the panel would like to sort of comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think trust is definitely um, is definitely something that you know stood out. Trust and transparency are definitely some you know two things that stood out in in the protests. And I wanted to speak, and this might also touch on some of the comments that Nelson, you know, raised, which, you know, which, which I really, really did appreciate. Um, and I think with the NSARS protests, right, what we really saw was something that was really driven by groups of people that have, all, when, you, when you compare the NSARS protests, you know, with the government's response, what you find is groups of people that are very much, you know, ideologically opposed. So even in terms of what they think of leadership. And that's why I really like the comment that Amaka raised, which is the fact that there were no visible people who were, you know, who stood out and said, yes, I'm the leader here, but there was leadership, right? And for me, it's, you, you see that when you understand that these two groups interpret leadership on two completely, in two completely different ways. So one group, which, you know, the end of the protesters, um, people who kind of conceived of leadership as something to do with service, right? I'm providing a service. I'm bringing in, you know, hand sanitizers. I'm, you know, I'm providing security. I'm providing legal aid. That was how they defined leadership. And that's what they expect from the government. I expect safety from my government. I expect, you know, a secure future, economic, you know, economic empowerment and things like that. Whereas the government traditionally, um, conceives of leadership, at least the Nigerian government traditionally conceives of leadership as a show of power and a demonstration of power. And that's why you see, you know, it's, it's a completely different, there's completely speaking two different languages, you know, and you have a government and that's what, this is where it touches on youth inclusion in politics and why we need to see more people who share young people's ideals and ideologies in politics. So not, not necessarily young people running for office, but people in office who share similar ideologies or similar um, or frame leadership in a similar way to young people um, nowadays um, do. Um, people in our government tend to be people who were, you know, these are people who were either involved in military governments or people who, you know, understand leadership 
through frames that were, you know, through, through, through frames that were designed through military dictatorships, through civil wars, through independence, you know, independence movements. And so there's a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a completely different approach that they take to leadership. And where it then clashes is with young people who want to see more than power, who want to see more than position from their leaders. And so that's where the disappointment comes from. And that's where the motivation actually comes from, with a lot of young people now being like, well, these people clearly have a way that they, you know, that they've designed what it means to be government and what it means to, you know, to govern. Whereas we kind of expect something different from the government. And so there is, you know, there is a lot of interest. And one of those things that they, that they demand to touch on, 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 on the statement um, is trust and transparency. Something, for example, that a lot of the institutions that were involved in, in the protest did really well was be transparent, was consistent communication with their audiences. I'm speaking about, you know, the legal aid teams, the NSARS response teams, feminist, um, feminist, the feminist coalition as well. These were groups that were constantly updating people on, here's how we spent your funds, here's how we've done this, here's, you know, here's, here's our plans, these are, these are who we are. It was very transparent. There was a lot of trust building, um, even among people on the ground as well, which, you know, Aki has spoken, um, spoken a lot about. But with the government, we don't necessarily get that. You know, we don't even get that with the response that they've, that they've given um, to the protests. We're getting, you know, reports around cameras, you know, being switched off. We're getting responses about they can't tell why there was a blackout in the area where the shootings happened. So there's a lot that's kind of, or, or you have the panel that, that went to, you know, a military hospital that was meant to be a crucial site in the investigation. And then they're blocked by, 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 by military forces. So even the, you know, the judicial, the, the judicial panel is on also facing roadblocks in some of the investigations that they're doing. And so for us, it just kind of shows that there's no, re there's no real attempt to really open up this case. And I think that, you know, that's, that's going to be the major determinant of, of whether we see some sort of resolution to this. It's going to take, you know, a lot of opening up um, of, 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 of the case. Thank you so much, Wale. Um, two last questions before we end. And um, one question is, <clears throat> In as much as NSARS was a protest, it was also rather a rather chilling case study of how information and misinformation can be weaponized politically. How do you think this affected the movement? This is from Damilalo. Um, yeah, so I think this question would go to um, Amaka. Are you, are you happy to take that one? Um, yeah, um, I think that um one way at least, because um, shortly after the protest gained momentum. The government announced the cyber warfare, cyber, cyber security secure program, the military. It was called Operation Crocodile. And immediately after, you could see different attempts, especially on social media, to smear some of the popular faces associated with the campaign. So a lot of people were, I think, I remember one of those days it was trending that one of the visible face faces had misappropriated funds and then that kind of um moved the conversation away from ending SARS to talking about oh who took this or who did not take money um so that was that was one case and then i remember a time because the obviously one of the leading faces for the movement was a feminist coalition and there were i learned of a lot of whatsapp messages saying that you know, first of all, Nigerians have a problem with feminists, you know, they are witches and any other negative attributes. And then they also added that they were, because one of the the feminist um, coalition had come out to say that they were supporting LGBTQ persons. So, you know, that was another campaign to kind of reduce the support because it's a very homophobic society. So you can imagine when you're talking about a group of feminists that are already witches and then they are supporting the gays. So those are some of the things, some of the measures that I, I think um ways in which and then all of a sudden there were a lot of bots on social media a lot of accounts opened in october and november coming up with ridiculous and unfounded allegations um i think all of this was like wale has talked about a lot of the key um leadership vehicles so feminist coalition and NSARS response illegal like they they received such widespread support because of how they were able to coordinate and give accounts um, for um, all of the resources and finances that were entrusted in their care, which I don't think any government at any level in Nigeria um, enjoys. So the goal was to 
come up with all these fake and unfounded rumors to undermine that leadership and creates, I guess, confusion. Um, confusion. And I think it's still ongoing. There are a lot of people that have now been accused of being affiliated to opposition political parties. And now the claim is that we're trying to use it to bring down the government or we're trying to, and, and, and the, they're trying to move the conversation towards social media regulation and how, you know, it's ruining our youth and we no longer have respect and all of that. So I think these are some of the strategies. And, you know, when you go into the realm of respectability politics with the older generation, people are like, ah, you have to talk kindly to your elders. How can you say Buhari has been a bad boy? You don't have respect and all of that. So it's, it's, they're tying this false information to, I guess, certain norms or accepted ways of behavior that would gain, I guess, a sort of acceptance. And part of, I think one of the more annoying aspects is this constant infantilization of young people. So you hear the government saying, oh, parents should talk to their children and their words or pastors. And you're like, but these are all grown up people, people like their twenties and, you know, early thirties participating. We have our own agency. We know what we want. So I think these are like some of the dynamics that I have personally observed since, since this started. Thank you. Thank you, Amaka. So we have we are going to have our last question before the end of this um, the end of this discussion, and this is from Kuhua, and she says that we, he or she says I'm not so sure uh, from the name. Following from the outside Nigeria, the demand for uh, by Nigerians for the end of SARS is reasonable and straightforward, as this is evidently a police unit that is harassing and murdering Nigerians. Why do you think the government or other authorities could not or would not disband SARS. I think this uh, may be answered by um, Akin. Is, is Akin still there? Um, or Wale? No, Akin. Yes, sure. I think. Um, yeah, so just I can. Okay. go ahead. Okay, so I could take this one. I think it's it really comes down to. Um, it really comes down to two things, right? Um, one, which is the statement that the police spoke, spokesperson made, I think it's, it was on the 9th of October, when, you know, the, the day after the protests officially began. And he basically went on Channels TV, which is a huge local, um, local, media, local media company here, and said, you know, that SARS cannot be disbanded because of the government's investment into the unit. And so on the one hand, and I mean, since all of this has been going on, you know, I've had to go back to revisit that statement. Because what does that actually mean? How much has gone into this unit? And what does he, you know, what does that term investment actually mean? And it could mean, you know, multiple things, the amount of money that's been spent into it, the amount of, you know, training or whatever has gone into it, which is why it makes sense that the government's approach has been, oh, we don't want to necessarily cancel it. Let's rename it and call it a new, a new team called SWAT. Um, or let's redeploy some of the soldiers in there. Um, there's also the serious case of Nigeria's, you know, under policing itself. Um, I don't think, I think we have about, um, we don't necessarily meet, there's, also, there's, there's a lot of claims at the moment that we don't necessarily, uh, that one of the justifications is because we don't necessarily meet the, the, the police to citizen um, ratio. And so there are all these figures going around and how, you know, this, you know, creates a case for, for having, you know, an extensive um, police force. But I think, you know, the other point, and I think this is the more important point, is on an ideological stand, you know, on an ideological point, which is what would disbanding SARS actually mean? Um, and what would disbanding SARS as a result of young people demanding its disbandment mean? It would mean this government having to cross over or having to engage with definitions of leadership that come with accountability, that come with responsibility, and that come with actual service. Like something that Nigerians are fond of saying is, you know, I'm a Nigerian, I'm my own country. I provide my own security. I provide my own electricity. I provide my own X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And yet, you know, we pay taxes. And so for a lot of people, this is an opportunity. I think a lot of young people see this as an opportunity to really restructure and rebuild the social contract. But there's a sense in which, you know, the government doesn't necessarily want to do that because it then puts claims and it creates, you know, the opportunity to make further demands. So today it's NSAS and tomorrow, like Nelson mentioned, it's actual police reform and, you know, let's actually do, let's actually do some work. And, you know, the next day it's let's kick out some corrupt 
you know, governments or corrupt governors or corrupt officials. And who knows, the next day it could be, you know, let's demand, you know, that, that, that the president step down. Of course, that, that's not necessarily what's going to happen, but that's how the government sees it. And that's why and that to me would explain, and that's how a lot of people are understanding the really harsh and really, you know, really aggressive response that the government has, you know, has, has, has made to, to the demands, which honestly are really simple. Like yeah. cuckoo, I mean. So let me, uh, let me back uh, Wale up there. And um, I, I will tell you this, there was a day I got up on the stage and I think it must have been the second day after they announced the disbandment of uh, the, the, the formation of the SWAT unit. And I, I, I think someone went up on the stage and he was and he's yelling, and what, and SARS, and SWAT, and SARS. And then it keyed into my thinking, I'm going, so you come up with this new unit, SWAT, you basically borrow the name of a tactical team from some foreign country. And then in context of Nigerian society, in terms of security architecture, you say, ha, ah, the SWAT team is going to be applicable. Nigerians are not dumb. Forget whether they watch foreign movies and they see what SWAT officers do. Again, SWAT in Nigeria, like, where do you even start from? The police station that's down the street from your house, when you call them and say, hey, I've got a robbery case going on, they can't even locate the first the place. First of all, if they're not familiar with the street. So you want to set up a security architecture and call it a SWAT unit when you don't have the infrastructure within the police force to even respond to typical day-to-day uh, domestic issues. So a lot of us just found it to be a very false or dishonest um, approach that was taken. And the demand was saying, hey, you know what? Show us you're really serious. I mean, if you say, okay, hey, you know, the SARS unit has been disbanded. We've taken AIG, so-so-and-so, and we made him new leader of a tactical unit because he's got X and Y background and he's going to spend the next two weeks coming up. I mean, let us see structure. Show us that you're serious. Give us, again, on a very simple platform, how you intend to transition from SARS to something else. None of that. It's just overnight we're going to announce a need. So we knew it was a scam. Let me use that word if it's appropriate here. And then secondly, when, when you know, while asking a question about why they would have found it difficult to disband SARS. Now, again, we're talking about a country that's suffering from institutional corruption. From the guy at the top to the guy at the bottom, when you're a police constable or you're a police recruit, your salary is less than 10000 naira. So basically, you have to prove to the bosses that you deserve the job. And what does that come with? Your earnings, your salary cannot even feed you for the month. Then they send you to an outpost on the roadside where you're collecting what we call a bunje, which is obviously bribe money. You got to turn that money into the local police officer, and then it rolls all the way up the food chain. When you think of the SARS unit, that same theory applies. So again, scrapping departments, obviously in Nigeria, you're thinking about, oh, someone's livelihood is going to disappear, but then guess what? You're going to shake the system. People love status quo. Okay, many of these guys are going to retire in a year, two years. They've already preempted their retirement plan on that unit. So we're talking about institutional reform. And when I think of the word SARS, as um, Nelson has stated earlier, it covers a broad expectation, which we're saying accountability. A police officer with a rifle to the AIG of a police uh, um, unit in a state or police commissioner, if they are found behaving differently from what the code of conduct says, can they be brought to justice? And I think that is what every Nigerian expects and is hoping with the overall reform we're seeking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akin, for that um, final thought. I think this has been quite a productive discussion. And um, at AfriSoc, our aim is to be able to bring these kinds of discussion onto this platform and be able to engage Oxford students, as well as alumni, and also the, the world in general on key issues that affect our societies. We're so grateful to have been part of this, and um, we welcome uh, the panelists to be part of uh, our next discussion, and we'll, we'll be getting in touch. Thank you so much for the audience for being uh, for joining and for asking questions, and I hope uh, from this discussion we've been able to learn one or two things. So this will be the end uh, from our side, unless there's any burning issue. Um, in this case, I will allow maybe 30 seconds for anybody to maybe raise their hand or just anything. But other than that, this will be the end of the uh, discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.